South Korea is an emerging world leader, the world's seventh largest exporting nation. They make more ships than any other country. We look at Korea today, it is emerging at such a pace that it's almost blindsiding some people right now. They're exporting more memory chips and display panels than anyone else on Earth. People who know this country view it the same way as we do, that it is a very dynamic, very energetic, hardworking country. They're designing brand new transport systems. South Korea has developed at an extraordinary rate. And a lot of that is to do with the fizzing energy, the frenetic pace of the economy, and the sheer energy that people are willing to invest in. And they're creating world-class art, cinema, and music. It's exciting for music to be such a big part of culture here. In the last hundred years, South Korea has been invaded, subjugated, and divided. But within two generations, it's brought about an economic miracle that's changed the face of the nation and put this country of nearly 50 million people onto the world stage. In the seventh century, three kingdoms came together to form Korea. Today, the country's physically divided, the result of a war that began in 1950 and never ended. The fighting stopped in 1953, but an uneasy ceasefire carries on. The demilitarized zone, or DMZ, marks the divide between South Korea and the communist north. Two million soldiers patrol the border. It's the most heavily fortified on Earth. Sitting at the end of a peninsula, South Korea is the size of Kentucky, with Japan to its east and China above North Korea. In less than six decades, South Korea has risen like a phoenix from the ashes to become an economic powerhouse with ambitions to match. On the international stage, it's hosted an Olympic Games, co-hosted the World Cup, and in 2010, it became the first Asian nation to host a G20 summit. President Lee Myung-bak welcomed the world's leaders to discuss economic and social issues. In the United States, where we're on track to cut our deficit... It put his country at the top table of international politics and highlighted the differences between the two Koreas. Koreans by nature are optimistic people. We couldn't have survived the war and the poverty uh, had we not been optimists. But I think with one big caveat, that we have a huge challenge looming over the horizon that most of our peers in the G20 don't have, and that is the challenge of what to do with North Korea. We have the fear that this might lead to another conflict that destroys everything Qi. They've broken the armistice on numerous, numerous occasions, most recently the unprovoked sinking of one of our naval vessels, the artillery shelling without provocation of Yongpyeong Island, the harassment, the, the threatening, all of those casts a very long, dark, uncomfortable shadow over South Korea. North Korea remains a secretive, totalitarian state. Run by a dynastic family who have controlled it since the ceasefire, it has one of the world's largest standing armies. North Korea, after the Korean War, was equally devastated. But having had uh, an industrial base prior to the Korean War, the North Korea recovered faster. And even into the late 60s, North Koreans were relatively wealthier, not a great deal, but they were better off than South Korea. But today, they're 1 30th, if that, of our GDP. South Korea is a country that was raised by war, and that total destruction of the war has given it a lot of the impetus for building from scratch. So when we look at many of the industries, people were willing to take very bold decisions because essentially they had nothing to, to lose. The foundations of South Korea's economy were built through government-sponsored schemes that encouraged the growth of family-owned industrial conglomerates known as chaebols. <laughs> Two of the most globally significant chaebols that have dominated the country's economy are Lucky Gold Star, or LG as it is today, and Samsung. Samsung started out in 1938 as Samsung General Store, which was a trading company which sold dried fish and other foodstuffs. 
our history starts from 1947. Uh, we started out as a small manufacturer of cosmetic facial creams for women. Uh, and then we ventured into other industries, such as plastic materials, uh, healthcare products, uh, household goods, electronics. After the devastation of the Korean War in the 1950s, Samsung began to move into new business areas to help rebuild the Korean economy. Some of those included, for example, textiles and sugar refineries. Now, by the late 1960s, Samsung began to move into the electronics industry. Hyundai is another of Korea's top chaebols. Its founder, Chung Joo Young, was born into a peasant family. He typifies the post-war breed of South Korean entrepreneurs. He went on a whirlwind tour of Europe. He first of all secured a set of orders from the Greeks that if he were able to build a shipbuilding industry, then they would buy ships from him. Predicated on that, he then travelled to London, where he met a, first of all, rather sceptical Barclays Bank and told them that the Koreans would build ships. And something about the charisma of the man persuaded Barclays that they should fund his project. And from nowhere, he went back down to the small fishing town of Ulsan, built dockyards, started building ships, and before long, the Koreans were the biggest shipbuilders in the world. South Korea is still the world's biggest shipbuilder, and this, the Triple E, will be the world's biggest ship. South Korea is making 10 of them, costing $1.9 billion. As long as the Empire State Building is tall and as wide as an eight-lane highway, each ship can carry 18,000 containers, enough to transport 18 million flat-screen TVs. While the economy has grown exponentially, South Korea's political journey toward democracy has been more tumultuous. A combination of military rule, dictatorship, corruption trials and assassination has dogged the country. The effects of this political instability can be seen even today, when its parliamentarians disagree in a spectacular fashion. South Korea's industrial rise has been less volatile, but no less challenging. Heavy industry and labor-intensive industry, like textiles, were the nation's mainstay in the 1970s. But its neighbor, Japan, had an unbeatable reputation for cars, electronics, and desirable gadgets. South Korea wanted what they had. In the early days, it's got to be admitted that Korea had a rather shady past in its relationship with Japan, that over the weekends, Japanese technicians would make a bit of extra money by coming over and selling secrets to the Koreans. Korea became a master of the copycat technology, but that doesn't mean that it isn't innovative. It becomes very powerful at using its control of management, of costs, of production systems, to be a very powerful, what it calls fast follower. The speed of South Korea's catch-up in the 1980s was meteoric. It became one of the tiger economies of Asia and a magnet for money. Investment in the economy was huge, both from abroad and at home. But by the late 1990s, the relationship between the banks, the chaebols, and the government created an investment bubble. In 1997, that bubble burst, and South Korea was bankrupt. The Asian financial crisis of the late 90s was very tough on Korea. Uh, about 20% of the large conglomerates uh, failed. Um, many of the others were in tough financial condition. South Korea needed a $58 billion bailout. The International Monetary Fund stepped in, but wanted to change the cronyism that had helped create the crisis. South Korea had survived occupation and war to become one of the world's leading trading nations. Could they do it all over again? Looking at the gleaming cars rolling off this Hyundai production line at a rate of 12,000 a day, it's hard to believe that 14 years ago, South Korea was bankrupt. Back in 1997, to save their country's failing currency, three and a half million Koreans donated jewelry and 227 tons of gold, which drove the global price of gold down to an 18-year low, but helped raise more than a billion dollars and demonstrated how determined the whole country was to rebuild its fortunes. 
there is a sort of esprit de corps, I have to say, and there is a very strong Korean national identity. This monument symbolizes the suffering of Korean families who can't return to the North since the ceasefire. This country has come so far, so fast, it has to do with the separation of other Koreans on the peninsula. And it has to do with the sort of yearning to create a greater Korea, a greater presence on the world stage. So I think that's the driving force. The International Monetary Fund's $58 billion loan to bail out the country came with provisos. The banking system was restructured and the Chaebols underwent change. Hyundai was at that time part of a larger Hyundai group that was diversified enough that even though it had problems, its survival still looked pretty solid. And in fact, realized that there was a good opportunity for acquisitions. That was the time that we were able to buy um, half of Kia, which at that time was the second largest automaker in Korea and was in real danger of failure. Buying Kia and the reorganization that followed the economic crisis took Hyundai from a car-making minnow to the fifth largest in the world. It's all a long way from the company's first car, the Pony. It was kind of a kit of parts. It was almost a, a United Nations of vehicles. The manufacturing and the engineering know-how came from the UK. The design came from Italy. The engine came from Japan. It was produced here. It was a little hatchback a coupe that we started exporting to the rest of the world. As Hyundai Motors have grown, their ambitions have too. Now the company's going head to head with some of Europe's most prestigious brands like BMW and Mercedes. The ambition early on was to produce vehicles. If you build them, they'll sell. We found out pretty quickly that if you build too many, you can get out ahead of your quality process. And so in 2000, we really retrenched and said, we're not gonna focus on volume anymore, we're gonna focus on quality. And spent the past 10 years reassessing what success meant. We think now success doesn't necessarily mean being number one. The goal now is to try and be the world's best automaker. And honestly, if we do that, the rankings will come on their own. When Samsung had problems with quality control, they chose a different way of dealing with it. In 1995, when a fault was found with some of the cordless phones produced at our Gumi plant, the chairman ordered about 2,000 executives together for a ceremony. And at that ceremony, these uh, cordless phones and other devices were destroyed in a ceremonial way. And this was really done in order to emphasize and make signal a real shift in the way that we approached quality management. Hyundai believes their success is due in part to improved products, but also understanding local markets. One of the ways that Hyundai Motor has really assured its success globally is relying on the expertise in local markets and not necessarily putting a Korean imprint everywhere around the world. It's an intensely pragmatic culture and a pragmatic business environment. When the global downturn hit in 2008, Hyundai America came up with a radical idea to get U.S. citizens to buy Korean cars. We created something we called the Hyundai Assurance Plan, and we basically said, if you buy a new Hyundai and you lose your job, you can give the car back. And the truth of it was, we didn't get many cars back, but it created a great deal of goodwill. The following year, Hyundai took on rival Toyota cheekily offering a $1,000 trade-in in the U.S. during the Japanese car giant's woes. And it worked. Hyundai increased its market share. South Korea's hunger to succeed enabled it to pay back its IMF loan three years early. And by 2004, it had joined the trillion-dollar club of world economies. I think globalization is inevitable. We've known that the world economy grows faster by interdependence and trade. If that is the paradigm, then for those of us who see ourselves as more advanced economies, have one goal, to climb the value added change. South Korea now has 10 companies in the global Fortune 500, has recently ratified a free trade agreement with the EU, and is close to doing a deal with the US. Subsec's home market of Korea is relatively small, which means that our growth is really outside of the country. So today, more than 90% of Samsung's revenue is generated in exports outside of Korea. One of the impressive things about South Korean industry 
is its ability to forge new markets very quickly, particularly being bold and going into areas where other investors, and particularly their rivals, sometimes are a bit fearful to go. And if you take a company like Samsung Electronics, it's the second biggest individual exporter from China. So they've certainly moved into these regional markets. As soon as they can see an opportunity, they'll move into it. In 2009, Samsung's profits would double Japan's nine major consumer and industrial electronics companies combined. In 2010, Samsung posted record sales, putting them ahead of Hewlett-Packard and Siemens. China is one of our most important markets today. It makes up around 16% of our global revenue. Obviously, with the growing Chinese middle class, there's a lot more demand these days for premium electronics products, like our flat screen TVs and smartphones. In 1990, there was only one flight a week between South Korea and China. By now, there are hundreds of flights each week. Now the push is more gravitating towards Vietnam and Indonesia. These are, again, tough markets. And the Korean background, coming from a nation raised by war, has created very bold leaders who like the idea of slightly tough, hard-to-work-in environments. And they're more willing to go there than, say, Japanese companies that can be more wary. If an American company opens a shoe factory in Indonesia, the Koreans will move there within months to build up a shoe factory to, to compete with it. In other areas, they are just being bold. At the moment, they're even looking at real frontier markets like Cambodia. So they're looking to build the first really big international airport in Cambodia, real estate, leisure there. They're outstripping the Chinese at the moment in the amount that they're investing into Cambodia. They're the biggest expatriate community in Indonesia. So they're really on the march in these kind of frontier markets. By 2009, South Korea was the world's ninth largest exporter. In display panels, memory chips and shipbuilding, they ranked number one. In mobile phones, second. Cars, fifth. Petrochemicals, steel and textiles were all in the top ten. But there are new global markets in South Korea's sites, the so-called soft power service industries. These are not factory but city-based, and they need highly educated individuals to create new wealth. Can South Korea Inc. become a world beater here as well? Just 60 kilometers from the border with North Korea, Seoul changed hands four times during the Korean War. Like South Korea's economy, it has been rebuilt and expanded, and is now one of Asia's international business hubs. Seoul's ambition is to compete with destination cities like New York or Paris. About half of South Korea's total population live in and around Seoul. That's 24 and a half million people. But while the city's natural setting, the mountains and the Han River are picturesque, Seoul itself is in need of a makeover. When we were growing rapidly, it was difficult for Seoul to pay more attention to making the city beautiful. Therefore, Seoul was regarded as a grey concrete city until five years ago. Part of it comes down to just the scale of the place. It's sprawling, it's huge, uh, it has a legacy of a lot of particularly ugly housing. And the problem with ugly housing versus ugly office buildings is people live in ugly housing. Uh, so you have to, it's going to take a very, very long time uh, to regenerate a lot of those areas. If anyone can do the regeneration, though, it, it's certainly the Koreans. The cultural legacy of the city is being rediscovered. This space is a reclaimed oasis in the car-choked streets to celebrate Sejong the Great, one of the nation's founders. This is the latest construction in the city's $102 billion project to make Seoul a design capital. We are currently building DDP on the land where Dongdaemun Stadium stood. The site has historical significance because there are the remains of a fortress wall and an army from the Chosun dynasty. This landmark building will house design-based businesses and become the fashion hub for South Korea. The site it sits in will be a green space in the city. We made a far-reaching decision to tear down the two stadiums and excavate the site to reveal our history from centuries ago. 
Now there is a history and cultural park of Seoul. Above the park, we are building a design plaza. We have employed cutting-edge architectural technologies to build this innovative design. Something else Seoul is determined to change is its traffic problem. South Korea wants to become the world's seventh green power within a decade. KAIST, the Korean Advanced Institute of Science and Technology, are developing a transport system to help them achieve that goal. OLEV, the online electric vehicle. The prototype buses and cars take up power magnetically from electric strips buried in the road. There are four supporting motors that are the same as diesel motors. The main motors sit at the back of the engine compartment. This black box is the battery. The size and cost of this battery is only a fifth of other electric buses' batteries. The screen over there has a green indicator for drawing the charge and a yellow one for recharging the battery. OLEV could change urban transport worldwide. And if 50% of Koreans switch to OLEV, the country could reduce its oil imports by 35 billion barrels a year. Only a third of the route needs to be capable of recharging. This system is a dream come true. From a country that was a fast follower, this South Korean innovation is set to challenge the rest of the world within the next few years. I think we will amaze the world with this innovative advance in transportation. While South Korea's industry has been focused for 60 years on exports, the city's tourism boss is focused on importing visitors. It's a green city, and we've been attracting uh, hordes of tourists. In 1980, we had one million visitors, or not quite. Ten years later, it became three million. And last year, 2010, we had almost nine million. One of the great challenges for South Korea right now is that it is bottom of all league tables when it comes to Asian tourism. Tourists don't want to go to South Korea. They want to transfer through the airport. Uh, they, they, they want to use its airlines. They don't necessarily want to get off the plane. We've uh, invested a lot of uh, time, energy, and money. The result is Incheon International Airport, Seoul's International Airport, has been voted the world's number one airport for six years in a row. South Korea is not yet in the ranks of Asia's top destinations, but it has plans to tempt the world's traveling consumers. We look at Korea today, it is emerging uh, at, at such a pace uh, that it's, it's almost blindsiding some people right now because all eyes are on China. Uh, eyes have sort of been on Japan, um, but certainly we've seen this, this China focus. But if you talk to luxury goods companies, uh, if you talk to retailers, uh, if you talk to even, even small trouser manufacturers in Italy, just focusing on the consumer side, uh, they say the most magical part of the world right now is, is South Korea. Look at the three main department store brands. These are not global household names yet, but you've got Shinsuke, you've got Lotte, you've got Hyundai. Three stores which rival pretty much anything in Tokyo. They beat the pants off of anything in Hong Kong. And you can pretty much write off North America, Australia, and Europe. In a very short span of time, our bathroom cupboards uh, or women's cosmetics bags are going to be full of Korean brands that are already billion dollar companies in their own right. Uh, they just haven't gone beyond the borders of that nation yet, but they're on their way. Millions of tourists do come, and thousands of people who work for multinational companies do stay. Seoul offers both luxury shopping and its own fast food. Bindatuk could be Korea's contribution to the menu of international foods found across the globe, like hamburgers and pizza. There are three or four things that the Koreans do incredibly well, which are also quite easy to transfer into um, a fast food format. Here is something which is just taking fresh ingredients and mixing them together, and you've got the wonderful taste and the ease of Korean pancakes. 
Fast food culture was introduced by the West Korea. So I think we can export Korean fast food, which has lots of vegetables and fermented ingredients, to the West. I think bindetok is particularly good for health-conscious Westerners. It's because it's made of mung beans. It's a mixture of ground mung bean, pork, kimchi and vegetables. So it's low-calorie but nicely nutty in flavour. Brand South Korea is becoming more of a reality and Seoul is its shop window. It has myriad assets from hot springs, um, of course, Korean cuisine. There's great shopping, there's amazing service, it has all of these things. But it hasn't been able to bundle together uh, all of these raw assets into a strong, compelling national brand. When people are asked to relocate for work to cities like New York or Stockholm, lots of people think this is good news. So perhaps after 10 years, Seoul might become one of those cities where people want to live before they die. That's one of my hopes for Seoul. While Seoul is making itself more beautiful, underneath, the city's heartbeat is digital. It's the most wired city anywhere and has world-beating creativity coursing through its veins. Korean pop, K-pop, has taken Asia by storm and now its stars are becoming big in the West. The Hallyu, the Korean wave, is a cultural phenomenon and in the global soft power stakes, it's been called the country's biggest weapon. When you look at raw soft power, those assets that, that can't be bought but are instantly loved and embraced by people around the world, um, the Koreans have understood uh, how to export those things in space. K-pop and now Hollywood film star Rain is one. He's been selected as one of People magazine's 100 most beautiful in the world. And film director Park Chan-wook, an award winner at Cannes, has Quentin Tarantino as a fan. And girl groups like Wonder Girls and Girls Generation have gone international, making millions in export revenues. The K-pop has um, definitely become a bigger influence than it was like five or ten years ago. So it's exciting for music to be such a big part of culture here. Thanks to the internet, you know, not just Asia, but all around the world. So it's been globalized, and I think um, a lot of the fans are around the world are enjoying the Korean music because it's easier to reach to, and it's, it's entertaining. <laughs> when you talk about exports, what gets out there quickly, what gets out there quickly in a wired world? Well, then we're talking about film, and we're talking about music, and we're talking about television. As well as K-pop, Korean soap operas, miniseries and films have won a huge following in Asia and across the world. Lee Byung-hun, star of Hollywood's G.I. Joe, has joined the ranks of other famous Koreans like Daniel Day Kim and Kim Yoon Jin from US TV's Lost. And Koreans are making an impact in sport as well, like Olympic skater Kim Yoo Na, golfers KJ Choi and Pak Se Ri, and footballer Park Ji Sung, who plays for the world famous Manchester United. I think the great appeal of South Korean culture from a pop culture point of view it is, it sounds odd, but it's, it's neutrality. I mean, the Koreans have become the acceptable, loved uh, face uh, of Asia. Uh, so if you are in Malaysia, uh, you happen to love these Korean pop groups. Uh, you know, if you're in Japan, uh, you love those dramas. Uh, and, and if you're in Thailand, uh, you like those actors and actresses. It's not only mass culture that has surfed the Korean wave. Korean art has gone mainstream in capital cities across the globe. The renowned Saatchi Gallery will show only Korean art when the 2012 Olympics is in London. Historically, South Korea is more worldly because its people are part of the cultural exchange. I think if you look at the current creative boom that's coming out of, of South Korea, um, it's benefited from two things. One is the enormous Korean diaspora around the world, and that's 
Koreans in Australia, the US, Canada, the United Kingdom. I think the other side, though, is education, just the sheer number of Koreans who go abroad to study. And what that brings them is a number of things. It's just exposure to different markets. Uh, you know, it, it delivers an understanding of how other people think, what makes other consumers tick. Per capita, there are more South Koreans studying in America than from any other country. In the 60s, during South Korea's political unrest, hundreds of thousands had emigrated to the US, but now many Korean Americans want to come back. Many of them settled in the US, and we now ha even have uh, hundreds of thousands of young people in their 20s and 30s in the U.S. who are uh, very Americanized, uh, somewhat global, who want to come back home. And many try, but they find that the market here is extremely competitive because the Korean youngsters have, in the meantime, become far more globalized than their Korean-American cousins who are insular, relatively speaking, who grew up in the U.S. This is a very interesting development. Another reason South Korea is so globally in tune is that the country is a trailblazer for high-speed internet. 81% of the population are wired to broadband. Seoul calls itself the most wired city on earth, and even in the subway, there is connectivity. Down, one okay. mm, this. Ah, no. We are here. First, go more. Go. Down, meaning next, is South Korea's favorite search engine and social networking site. Four out of five are registered users. And this new digital world is changing some traditional Korean aspirations. Traditionally, on a Korean baby's first birthday, it's encouraged to pick up something from the party table. They put out things like money. If the baby selects money, it will become a business tycoon. Recently, parents have started putting down a computer mouse, so if the baby picks it up, they'll succeed in IT. You see, the internet is so widely used that it's even changing our traditions. Small IT companies are multiplying fast in South Korea, and young people are attracted to their different way of working. In the past, graduates from the top universities wanted to work for Chabols, but now they want to join IT companies, where they can work on their own initiative, unlike at the big companies. I think this kind of shift will slowly change the working cultures in Korea. It's not just how people work, it's changing who works. A high percentage of the industrial giants, the Chabols workforce, is male, and an even higher percentage of men fill the top jobs. But in these new industries, things are changing. There are lots of women in senior positions in IT, and the ratio of men to women is 50-50. This is a very new working culture in IT, and many Koreans in high-level jobs find it odd. What's happening in IT reflects a change in South Korean society. Some of the old ways are being challenged by the young. And the Chabol system is more than 60 years old. The problem is the Chabol system is very strong. So if you get a dynamic little middle order company, it will either get broken down by the Chabol in the sense that it's a supplier to the Chabol, so the Chabol will start to demand tough terms from it and it will feel pressured financially. On the other hand, if it's doing really well, a Chabol will just buy it. Young South Koreans' priorities are different to their industrious parents and grandparents who worked long hours to raise their country into an economic powerhouse. And soft power is accelerating the speed of that change. These Koreans are world leaders in online gaming. They're eSport players, competitive video gamers, and in South Korea, it's big business.
byproduct of the broadband boom, some 70 million Koreans are gamers, and hundreds of thousands watch their heroes in action. E-athletes pitch their skill at obliterating opponents, whether they're in the same room or across the globe. Matches are broadcast onto dedicated TV channels, and the top players' fan clubs are bigger even than many K-pop stars. Koreans love e-sport because we have a professional league and e-sport athletes are very competitive. With so many fans, I hope that e-sport can get even bigger. Born in a digital age, young Koreans expect instant gratification. Especially the younger generation are used to speed. They're speed addicts. When they turn on their computer, they want it to boot instantly. 30 seconds is too long. They want to be everywhere all at once, unless we're able to provide services that take these young people where they want to be very, very quickly, either in cyberspace or in real space. Uh, we have problems. South Korea wants its young people to be as nationally proud and committed as their parents are to the enormous advances the country has made. But there are problems. Its infrastructure, education, politics, and law still lag behind the best in the world. President Lee Myung Bak has reform on the agenda, but the speed of change has been questioned. A lot of Koreans really mistrust their political elite, their judiciary, even their own military. So there are lots of areas where the Koreans still feel that reform is needed. The problems are very clearly diagnosed, even by the government itself but they feel that there's only very, very tepid reforms being pushed to try and change those institutions. Socially, there was a, a great deal of pent-up resentment at government policies that didn't seem to provide for increasing amounts of welfare for the population as a whole. That is changing. The Korean government's public welfare budget has increased dramatically in the last decade and a half where today it takes up the lion's share. This big industrialization, though, does have a dark side to it. Because although Korea could be incentivized to work like this, it became almost a compulsive working society. People became addicted to their work, and in many ways they still are. In modern era, uh, one expression has become synonymous with Korean character, bali bali. It's a hurry, hurry, right? Mm -hmm. It's been a hurry, hurry culture with its positive and pejorative connotations. I think we have learned from this. A lot of these things we have achieved in such a short period of time is because of the hurry, hurry and bali bali culture. For Korea to move forward in some ways, it needs to take a step back. Its education system and its companies are locked into a certain way of thinking of rote learning, of mass production, and there needs to be a sense of how do we incorporate cre creative thinking, innovation, different types of companies into our economy? How do we allow the middle order, more innovative companies to stand on their own and not be eaten by the chairboard? But even as they begin to address their social problems, South Korea's political ambitions are starting to be realized. When President Lee myung bak hosted the G20 in 2010, the country believed it was time they were recognized as one of the world's developed nations, but with an awkward history. Because of North Korea always sitting there looming on the border, South Korea has always wanted to be known for, first of all, its democratic triumph and throwing off a military dictatorship at the end of the 1980s that then was almost celebrated by the Olympics. Then, later in 2002, we have the World Cup shared with Japan, which they saw as another great coming out festival, which again so upset North Korea that they tried to upset it with a naval battle off the coast at the same time. And then, more recently last year, we had their presidency of the G20. At the G20, the South Koreans presented an initiative suggesting a different way to give aid to underdeveloped countries. And the head of the IMF praised Korea for its intellectual leadership. Now, we spent a lot of time in the history of Korea looking at Korea as a nation that was a fast follower, that was master of catch-up or being a copycat. So when he went out and praised some of the economists from Korea as being intellectual leaders, that was something new. 
I think over the next decade, we're certainly going to see more and more spheres of life where the Koreans are giving leadership, ideas and creative thinking fields where we haven't even seen them before. But South Korea remains only half of a nation that has existed since the 7th century. Could it be in this century that it unifies with the North? There are many optimists who think that the unification could actually be the shot in the arm that the South Korean economy has always needed. That there's going to be a cheap workforce, there's going to be room for development of South Korean factories up north, that always South Koreans are looking for that point of comparison with Japan. Will unification be the thing that gives us that extra fillip and brings us up to the level that the Japanese are at? Even without unification, to progress and get that competitive edge, South Korea needs its trademark on products to be as nationally strong as French perfume, German cars, and Japanese technology. Once upon a time, Samsung, they fought purely on price. Uh, now they fight on design and service. It is our technology that made your life smart. We're now approaching what I sort of see as the third Korean wave. If the first Korean wave was LG, Samsung uh, arriving in our households, uh, more Hyundai vehicles and Kia showing up on the street. Uh, if the second wave um, was the K-pop boom, the soap opera boom, um, let's say the whole soft power boom that we've seen from South Korea, the third wave um, is going to be an industrial and brand one. And what we're about to witness are Korean brands hitting every other part uh, of, of our daily life. After 60 years of near relentless growth, does South Korea feel it has achieved its goal? And is there more to come? On the whole, I think South Koreans today, in 2011, feel relatively comfortable economically. Um, there isn't a great deal of discontent in their lives. They worry about uh, North-South Korean relations. They worry about the environment. They worry about the scarcity of resources. They worry about their children. Uh, but these are the worries of a relatively affluent, relatively comfortable uh, economy anywhere on this planet. Uh, the only distinction, I think, is that the Koreans may be still a bit more hungry than the wealthier European countries or North American countries. Now is an interesting time to be Korean and see how well South Korea can fulfill its promise of great things to come. Everything points to a vibrant country that has married the best of both Western and Asian culture in a free market economy, and it could well make South Korea the nation to watch.